Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name is Dave Marshall and this episode is one Caitlin recorded with Dr. Ted Deschler from the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University on late Devonian vertebrates. But before we get to that, there's a little bit of a backlog of PaleoCast news that we have to get through first. All of the PaleoCast presenters have been really busy over the last month, out in the field or writing up research, so apologies that it's taken us until now to get the new episode out. But we hope you've been enjoying the blogs that we've been having by Chris Barker in the meantime. That blogging platform will always be available to publish content, so if you've got something to write about, please get in touch. As to my whereabouts, I've just taken on a new job that will see me researching for a major documentary that will be out in about six years, so the PhD has been put on hold for a while. I'll keep on working on PaleoCast and the Virtual Natural History Museum, of course, but now there'll be a little bit of both of those projects making it onto the small screen. Hopefully I'll be able to tell you all some more information as and when things develop, but until then, things have to remain tightly under wraps. Thanks to all of those of you who voted for us in the annual podcast awards. Hopefully we'll make the shortlist again and even win this time. So keep your eyes open for an announcement about that soon. Our recordings of conferences will hopefully be released in the next couple of weeks. Uh, My laptop had broke and so I'd been left without the ability to edit any footage or even record any new interviews. But I've now got an even bigger and better one, so hopefully you'll start to see a lot more video content coming out soon. And finally, we've got our art competition that will be running for the entire month of August. Entries must all be original, so nothing that you drew last month. And to enter, just send that work to info at paleocast.com and we'll post them on our social media channels for the public vote. Once a piece of artwork is online, each favourite or like will count as a vote and you're allowed to share or retweet entries to get more votes for the pieces you like. You can follow the competition by using the hashtag PaleoCastArt. Full terms and conditions are available on our website and a big thanks for the prizes has to go to Bruce from PaleoZoo and to Paleo artist Bob Nichols from Paleo Creations. Bob will even be joining us on the 1st of September to announce the winners and to discuss his work as a paleo artist. So as always, please like and share this episode on social media. And if you've not done so already, you can subscribe to the show on pretty much any platform now, but let us know if you can't find us. We're still committed to bringing you this show completely ad-free, so any contributions via our donate button on our website would be much appreciated. We don't get any funds from any other source. So... With all of that out of the way, we can finally bring to you this interview with Dr. Ted Deschler discussing late Devonian vertebrates. We hope you enjoy this episode. Dr. Ted Deschler is the Associate Curator of Vertebrate Zoology at the Academy of Natural Sciences and Associate Professor in the Department of Biodiversity, Earth, and Environmental Science at Drexel University, and he studies the vertebrate faunas of the late Devonian period. Hi, welcome. Thanks a lot. Nice to be here. Thank you so much. So I always like starting off my interviews by finding out how somebody became a paleontologist. Okay. Okay. Um, Geoscience first. Geoscience major, Franklin and Marshall College in Pennsylvania. Loved it. Um, Such a great major. Um, Dr. Roger Thomas was a professor there, and as a senior project, I got to dig in and uh, dissolve away some Cambrian limestones and look at the kinoderm plates and things, and just thought, this is awesome, you know, and learned that tying the history of the Earth to the history of life on Earth was a really interesting and fun field to go into. Awesome. And then you did your master's at Berkeley, is that right? right? And that was actually in a paleontology department when they had paleontology Yeah, yeah. And they've now become integrative biology, which is cool, sort of a sign of the times. Um, But yeah, when I was there, uh, paleo department, we had people doing all sorts of stuff. I did mammalian, sort of Cenozoic mammals, um, looking at a site out there in the Bay Area. 
10 million year old site that had been twisted on end by all the tectonism out there and stuff, but horses and camels and uh, big dog-like things. It was really fun to work on. And I did more of the sedimentology of the site than the actual fauna itself. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, so what would you be doing if you weren't a paleontologist? Yeah, you know what I love? I love uh, photography. Hmm. So I love being outdoors, which kind of overlaps, yep. of course. Um, I kind of love that creativity that comes with, with, with photography. And I think part of, I've always thought this because I have friends who are architects. And I think as a scientist or an architect, mm -hmm. my wife tells me I'm too symmetrical all the time. Um, I think I think I, I enjoy spaces mm -hmm. and three dimensions. And um, so I think, you know, yeah, I love photography as maybe that maybe that is just a hobby. I couldn't say I could ever be a professional, but um, I think architecture might have been something I would could have uh, could have enjoyed as much as I enjoy paleontology and yeah. geoscience. And do you get to incorporate photography into what you're doing? I do. Now? Thank you for asking. Yes, indeed, I really do. I both in a formal sense, and we're now 3D imaging fossils, and of course, always been very important to to document fossils, mm -hmm. you know, two dimensionally. Standard photography still is. Uh, for journal publications mm -hmm. and that sort of stuff. Um, but I think, and as part of the sort of outreach potential of paleontology, we need to be able to show people how exciting it is to be in the field, yeah. to communicate geology and the excitement of exploration. And, and so I definitely think uh, photography has been something that has inter, uh, you know, overlapped with my interests in science. So you studied the vertebrates that lived in the late Devonian. Yes. What was the planet like at that time? Um, of course, plate positions were quite different. There was a Euro-American landmass. So we have North America, where I've done most of my work, connected up with Greenland and Northern Europe, basically. Um, and then a southern landmass of sort of the Gondwanan, you know, all the, all the, the southern continents. And they were actually both kind of uh, straddling the equator. Um, and from what we can tell about the paleoenvironmental conditions, particularly here in Pennsylvania and up in the northern parts of Canada where I've worked, um, it may have been semi-arid, um, you know, seasonal type climates. Um, and so different world, um, but at the same time, the processes of sedimentation and so forth were, were the same things going on today. So when we look at our rocks and interpret our rocks, we're looking, you know, so sort of that uniformitarian idea about processes being similar. What was very different, and so from a paleontological perspective, is where we were in the history of life. Mm -hmm. So the the Devonian, first of all, I always got to give credit to the plants. The Devonian was the greening of the earth, and that's so important to what happened with verte invertebrate and vertebrate life after it as far as terrestriality goes. Mm -hmm. um, so so greening of the earth in the Devonian and then in the end of the Devonian, as, as productivity increased on land and in freshwater stream systems, that's when the activity of uh, vertebrates who began to specialize up into those newly developing ecosystems also elaborated, diversified, wherever the case might be. And the, one of the most, most interesting things that we get to study in the late Devonian are those very specialized fishes of the, of the Sarcopterygian or lobe fin group that um, are specializing to live in shallow water, to push around in the bottom, to you know find prey up into little ponds, whatever it might be. It's a little hard to know exactly why, but their appendages are being more and more limb-like, and that's leading post Devonian to the origin of limbed animals. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So at so at this point there's nothing living on land really. You've got the plants and then you said arthropods. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then we get these terrestrial vertebrates. Right. And they're coming from these fish. Mm -hmm. And so are they developing limbs and things while they're still in the water and then transitioning to land? How is this whole transition happening? Yeah, precisely. Okay. It, and that, that's just such the story of evolution is kind of features that were developing for one purpose are useful when a new opportunity arises, a new ecological opportunity. So yes, the, the, as far as we can talk now, remember uh, it's important to sort of see these, these lobe fin fishes. It's not just that appendage evolution. The appendages are attached to uh, girdles, the pectoral girdles for the front and the pelvic girdles in the back. And so there's a lot of evolution of those girdles, which are supporting weight. 
the skull is absolutely changing significantly. You know, same thing for different sort of specializations, perhaps for shallow water. Uh, we're losing some of the bones, um, which we would consider as the, the, the bones bridging the skull to the shoulders, so the neck bones, mm-hmm. making the skull more mobile and the shoulders more independent of the skull. Um, tails are being minimized. The, 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 the paired fins, oh, excuse me, the, the, the dorsal fins on the back um, are being minimized. So it's all over the body. These changes are happening. And for just as you say, these weren't adaptations for terrestrial life. They were adaptations for a different ecosystem, you know, shallow water, whatever it might have been. But then when there was an option, when there was an opportunity to become even more specialized, perhaps more time on land, more whatever the case might be, um, more ability to find food and all that sort of thing, those features were there to, to tweak even further um, uh, in that direction. Sounds anthropomorphic. I don't mean that, but you get the idea. Totally. Yeah. So this is a re- obviously an extraordinary transition in Earth's history. And what is the fossil record like? How do what kind of picture do we have of these animals? Yeah, it's 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 gotten a lot better in the last twenty five years or so, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. It really is all over the world. Um, European scientists, Australian scientists, uh, North American scientists. I think the Devonian is becoming like the Cretaceous. I mean, there's so many people <laughs> focusing in there. It's yeah. amazing. Um, it's great. Um, and, and actually, I'm joking a little bit about that. I'm not quite sure if we're getting that many <laughs> yeah. people coming down into the Devonian. But the record has gotten a lot better for all of the groups. And, and you know, I, we've been talking about the fin to limb transition, but from that same slice of time, we're seeing uh, kind of the final diversity of placoderms, armored fishes, that are then sort of dropping out, you know, and we're seeing the end of most of the jawless fishes sort of in the same period, but we're seeing the beginning of ray fins, the, the, the fish that dominate, the, the bony fish that dominate the world today. Um, so it, it's a really interesting time, and the record ain't half bad. Um, there's a lot of deposits and you just need eyes out there looking, mm-hmm. spending the time going to these places. I've kind of gotten in this mode of going to very challenging places, uh-huh. which I enjoy. Um, you just got to get out there and do it. Yeah. So yeah. you do a lot of field work and Devonian rocks are in some very interesting places mm-hmm. on the planet today. Mm-hmm. So where have you gone to okay. find them? It all started on simple highway road cuts in Pennsylvania. Um, the Catskill Formation, Lake Devonian, stream deposits, red beds, classic stuff. Material had been known out there. Al Romer, you know, the mm-hmm. classic North American paleontologist, had worked out there a little bit. Used his field notes when I started. A guy named Keith Thompson, who I knew well at the time, had done some work out there. Um, so you, I'm following in the footsteps of these giants, basically. But new highway construction had opened up new windows into this Catskill Formation. And then since we've started out there, there's even been some new projects. We keep trying to get into them as they're blowing up all this rock and moving it around, and we've had good success. So really it's a function of how much rock has been moved by the highway department that we've had good success in Pennsylvania. From there, we realized that it would be really cool to study um, a little deeper in time, um, maybe look at some, this transition was, was of particular interest, and we learned of rocks way up in the Canadian Arctic on Ellesmere Island, um, similar to the Catskill Formation in, in their depositional environments, but a little older, mm-hmm. which was cool. Um, and then it was only a matter of figuring out how to do it, how to fund it, and how to get the equipment and everything. And um, Neil Shubin, my, my closest colleague, and I, um, Neil had done a lot of work in Greenland with a group from Harvard. And so we, they kind of had knowledge about working in Arctic conditions. They brought that knowledge to us with equipment and tents and what food works best and what boots work best and all that kind of stuff. And we just applied that. And we've now had eight field, season up on, field seasons up on Ellesmere Island. And we feel like we can go back there at the drop of a hat because we have gear you know, up in a research um, mm-hmm. facility up there, a Canadian facility. So that... It, it's a little bit challenging. Um, you go there in the summer only, and it's expensive because you need some helicopter time to get you out there. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but but the payoff has been fantastic. Um, then for the first, we, we, we Neil and I got a grant to work in the Antarctic. 
Um, in the Dry Valleys region, not too far from McMurdo Station, there's a late part of the Middle Devonian, something called the Aztec Siltstone. Material had been found, vertebrate material had been found, mostly by geological teams. Um, a paleontologist named John Long from Australia had been in there, and there were a number of publications, not based on a very large collection, though. Um, and so we thought we should get in there and make a spend some specific time, focused time on fossil collecting, not just on mapping stratigraphy and things. So we, we actually just got back about a month and a half ago from that trip, which worked out very well. Uh, first time down, so there was a lot to learn about the logistics and... And uh, thank goodness for the research base and the facilities and all the support they provide down there at McMurdo Station. Um, good results. The fossils aren't even back yet. Yeah. I haven't opened them up yet. That was my next question. Yeah. How do you even get fossils back from yeah. these places? Um, we flew, which was great. The fossils came on a ship. Okay. <laughs> so when McMurdo Station gets their resupply ship um, in late January each year, um, that's when the ice, like say, so they follow an icebreaker in, mm -hmm. but um, um, they put all the science cargo that needs to go north on the ship, and then it sails up across the Pacific. So we're thinking, don't sink, don't sink, yeah. you know, my ship with all the fossils. Of and of course, it's not going to yeah. sink. So the wooden crates, that we have about 500 pounds of, of specimens in, in wooden crates, mostly pretty small samples. It just worked out that way. Um, are right now on land in California, I'm glad to say, Good. and they will come across country on a truck, and we'll see them within a couple of weeks. And my colleague, John Long, who, John Long, who I mentioned, had been out there before, joined our team, which mm -hmm. was awesome, and he's coming to Philadelphia, and we're going to open these crates, and, and we'll get the other team members, Neil will come out, and um, it's, it's like Christmas. Yeah, that's yeah. so exciting. <laughs> yeah. What is the most difficult place that you've ever excavated, and was it worth it in the end? Okay, most difficult. And I've done, like, I've done in the Mesozoic of the American West mm -hmm. and the Cenozoic and such, trying to think. I, I got to say it, it would be, uh, you know, we were lucky we didn't get really nailed by any bad weather in Antarctica. So, and we spent a lot more time in the Canadian Arctic. And so there were times where we actually were working in a quarry, uh, a site where we were digging. And when you're not moving in the day, when you're actually working in a quarry and it's drizzly and like 35 degrees Fahrenheit and, you know, just kind of miserable, mm -hmm. that, that's the challenge. Now that quarry is the site that I'm thinking of is the site where Tiktaalik rose came from. So definitely worth so it. So it was worth it, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Any problems with bears up there ever? Thank goodness not, because those are not, the white bears are not friendly bears. Oh, no, 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 we did have to be prepared. Um, the geeks with guns, as my wife would say. <laughs> um, but we, we never had to even think about using them. They just make you be prepared. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. It's good to be prepared. <laughs> yes. So as a museum curator, you really participate in the whole fossil collecting process. So what happens to a fossil in between the time that you find it, and it potentially takes a boat to California and a truck to get to you, and then when it actually goes on display in a museum and yeah. the public gets to see it? Yeah. Well, a lot. And of course, not everything goes on display mm -hmm. eventually either. Um, that's just, that, that is part of the process. And as a curator in a museum or, or a prof and a professor, but particularly the, the museum curator side of me. Um, obviously, the first thing you do is this kind of making sure that you keep all the documentation. Mm -hmm. um, and documentation then follows it to preparation. Um, sometimes, you know, these things are split pieces of shale. There's not a lot of preparation to do. But what we are concerned about is, okay, when this thing sits on a museum shelf, it's going to be in a box with some inert material lining the box. If, it's, if it has a tendency to fall over or anything like that, we're going to kind of um, uh, make a contoured form for it so it sits in this box so that when you pull a drawer, things aren't moving around. We're going to get that thing numbered We're gonna so that we're never going to forget or lose track of what site it came from and all that. And I'm talking me for research projects we might do or people two generations six generations from now mm -hmm. that need to come back and look at these specimens or, or you know have a research question of interest that these would be useful for so so we have to make sure that the data and everything stays with it so so curation is absolutely critical mm -hmm. then the research stage if it's a project that we choose to to undertake and, and doesn't mean everything we find we're going to necessarily do a paper on 
Um, although students can students work on stuff and so forth and so on, but not all of it comes out in publication in the first ten or twenty years of of, of having a specimen. Yeah. Um, but when it does come time to something we're going to do research on, you know, we document it mm-hmm. the, the imaging techniques that are available to us today, whether it's CT, three D scan, traditional photography. That's very important. Mm-hmm. Um, we, of course, do the literature search that you need for comparison. I always tell paleontology is really just like compare this to that. You're really just doing that. You're seeing what is known, compare the anatomy, mm-hmm. what's different, what's the same. Um, producing the, 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 the publications, which, of course, go beyond. My work does tend to be descriptive. Um, I think it sort of sets the groundwork um, for the next stages, no matter what they may be. They may be people uh, doing more details about the, the, the you know, biomechanics of the animal. Uh, they may do isotopic work on, on the bone or the teeth or, or the rock matrix. Um, there's no end to sort of the questions that might come up that this material may inform. But what I hope I can do is describe it, get it in the literature, get, let, let people know these kinds of specimens exist in this museum or in a museum in Canada or mm-hmm. whatever the case might be. And um, so that's very important. Yeah. yeah. What portion of the specimens that you have at the museum would you say are actually on display? Fraction. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's um, back in it, it is. And most of it, I mean, because we work on Devonian fish. Yeah. It's kind of like the, the joke about the Devonian and the Cretaceous. If I was finding Tyrannosaurids, okay. You know, yeah, more of it would be out. But, um, yeah, um, we've done some short-term displays Mm -hmm. to sort of bring up, hey, we do research here, and this is the kind of stuff. There is a display about Tiktaalik at our museum in in Philadelphia, and um, casts of it that we've exchanged for educational purposes Mm -hmm. have gotten around and so forth. Um, we there's a little bit of a website on TikTok that the folks at the University of Chicago have done, so we like that kind of outreach as well. Um, but as far as like yeah, putting these things on a museum floor, I don't know that much of this ever will see that yeah. um, unless it's a very specialized short term sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. What is your favorite display that's actually at the museum right now? Yeah. What do we do? We we uh, in Philadelphia we have a, a real deep history, which is fun, especially for North American paleontology. Mm. And uh, we just, it's really neat, the first dinosaur skeleton ever mounted in the history of the world came from New Jersey. Who thinks? New Jersey. No. Dinosaurs. No, mm-hmm. southern New Jersey has Cretaceous beds. It was discovered in 1858. Wow. It's a hadrosaur. And Joseph Leidy at the Academy of Natural Sciences named it Hadrosaurus fulci, compared it to Iguanodon and things that had been found in England. Um, but he knew it was different, and there was enough of the skeleton, it was about 30% complete, that he worked with a British artist named, a sculptor named Waterhouse Hawkins, who had made the amazing models at Crystal Palace um, exhibition mm-hmm. previously. But now Hawkins could work with Lighty with an actual, enough of a skeleton to do the proportions and understand the, the animal a little better. They mounted Hadrosaurus foci. First time in the history of the world a dinosaur skeleton was put together. It was in Philadelphia, 1868. The mount hung around for a while, then it wasn't important anymore, and just kind of went away. We don't know exactly what happened to it. Oh, wow. um, some other mounts were kind of also created and sent to other museums. We don't know what happened to them either. Sort of plaster would fall apart, and sure. iron armature and stuff. We just remounted Hadrosaurus Fulci which is cool. Wow. We talked about doing it the old way and the new way, because the old way was definitely, like, the posture and everything was very different. Sure. Um, and, but we did it with our modern understanding, because we wanted to be able to... They didn't know the skull, and in the old way, all they could do was get a big lizard skull and enlarge it. They put an iguana skull, basically, on top of this oh, hadrosaur wow. skeleton, which was their best guess, yeah. because of what the few little pieces of teeth they had. Iguanodon, right? Iguana, okay. <laughs> um, so we put on top of it the best guess we had, but we we can much more precisely bracket. It's not these are reptiles. Now we can say these are reptiles within this hadrosaur clade, and we could, in fact, they have a non crested hadrosaur clade. So we could get really pre- more precise, but still have to guess. It was just cool yeah. for people to understand, like, okay what the skull would look like. So now, right now, we have a newly mounted, well, it's about three years old. It's been mounted in the academy. 
with a skull, which is kind of a, 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 a Myasaurus skull with a little, little tweaks just for fun sort of thing. And, um, and what we've done over the last three years is a huge chalkboard behind it. And we get different artists to draw their, their concept of what this hadrosaur may have looked like. And the latest one was just done by Ray Troll, who's an oh, amazing course, artist. Yeah. yeah um, doing a lot of paleo art. So, so that's my favorite oh, display. Right? Sorry, that's a long answer. Oh, no, I've got to go see it now. That sounds <laughs> yeah. awesome. Yeah. All right, so I'm actually finishing up. So this is my last question. And I just wanted to know, is there anything going on in paleontology right now that, like, research-wise that you're not involved in that you think is really interesting? Wow, gosh, so much. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I'd say, and, and this, is, um, this, this shows my Paleozoic bias, mm-hmm. I mean, because there's so much going on in the Mesozoic, Cenozoic, and nothing against all of that. And, and we're really, we're, I just say, in the most general sense, we are redrawing the tree of life, you know, our understanding with, with, the, with the phylogenetic work and everything else. We're really understanding more. And as far as that goes, I think newer discoveries out of China, particularly, that are helping redraw those most early branches of jawed vertebrates or bony fish and what groups belong as stem groups there and, and, and so forth and so on. Is, is very important, very good. We're, we're breaking the old paradigm because we're learning more and we're being more, um, more precise about how we're making those evolutionary um, um, connections. So I think that's terribly exciting yeah, for your field. Definitely. How long yeah. do you think it's going to take to go through all of the fossils that you have coming back from in that art group right now? I, good question. Um, going through could mean simply unpacking, yeah. which which won't take that long, although we want to savor every minute of it. <laughs> um, so I would think we'll have everything by the end of the summer. So let's say by, by the end of uh, August, we'll have everything cataloged, unpacked, reasonably housed and sorted. Um, um, and we'll probably start some research projects in the meanwhile, but then we're sort of, we feel like the stuff is safe, sound, and here for the rest of history. Great, yeah. fantastic. Well, good luck with good. that, and thank you so much Caitlin, for Caitlin, my to pleasure. Me. Really nice to talk to you. Thanks. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall, with Joe Keating, Laura Soll, Liz Martin Silverstone, and Caitlin Colary, who was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association. But the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast and like us at facebook.com forward slash Paleocast to get all the latest news.